We have Amit Sricha on next, the master of panorama. part was that uh, I walked into it saying this is wrong, 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 and you know, why is there child labor in India? And so it was sort of a, you know, a very strong viewpoint that I began with. But then when I landed there, I found uh, that there were wheels within wheels, that how the government systems work, and how the parents tried to send their children to school, and the school there was no teacher, and since there was no teacher, they were getting to drugs. And so to keep them away from drugs, the parents said, okay, you won't work, at least you'll work. 
So there were all these, uh, you know, factors that it, it just made the whole system uh, quite, uh, quite different from what I had imagined. Well, so in some ways it, it sort of uh, helped me formulate uh, a sort of thing which of course, of course it's not very good in real society. It sort of made me realize that there, there are no absolute whites and blacks in, in life and it's all subtle shades of everything that is going on and so uh, perhaps the way forward is not to come in with any strong viewpoint because that viewpoint doesn't seem to necessarily work with with everything you do. But of course, I mean, I didn't quite realize as, as I, uh, as my wife now knows that it's not the best of things to to be a shades of gray person who can't decide whether this is right or whether this is wrong. But anyway, so I'm just going to lead you through uh, just two images to show a whole bunch of work that happened I did from child labor, I did uh, several NGO projects and and then of course there was a national literacy mission but then there was a lot of work that was happening in Delhi in which is I, was, I was engaged with which is magazines and books and uh, some commercial stuff and so, so just stuff that we were doing regularly on a regular basis or for magazines here and, and in this in fact that there's that book on Goa which was interesting, which happened all the way back in 1991, where I went and shot it over uh, three seasons, and then I came back, and then you know I made a selection, and then I was supposed to sit with the publisher and uh, and do the layouts and design and everything, and then I, I got a call saying uh, an invite to the, the launch of the book. So I said, hang on, what happened? So they said, oh, we called you, but uh, you didn't pick up the phone. And so that was that. I never got to edit my book. It just came out without uh, any of that. So there's something to really watch out for, you know, as photographers, that you've got to make sure that that first project happens right. And more such projects, um, books and I mean, books that have contributed towards or which are entirely from my work, and then uh, all this sort of work uh, culminated into, you know, producing a little exhibition in 2003, which was uh, sort of of the nature of presenting a little bit, uh, well, it, it was some of the profound and some of the quirky elements of life. So, so just a, a few images from that. This is uh, two men on a vintage car on a puddle. And, you know, so he, there were some elements of quirkiness, and like this, this was the whispering cow. And this was the, the foreigner teaching the Indian the last art of yoga. This was this was like the village beauty parlor, where actually they were making uh, silk. So, but I mean, they had incredibly smooth legs because every piece of hair had been pulled out by that making process. And that was the tree truck. So anyway, that that literally worked through one phase of, of what I did, and um, it's it's interesting is because that the whole uh, 80, eight, eight, late 80s, in fact, early, yeah, middle 80 onwards, there's there was always this conversation about you know the rejection of pictorialism and the movement you know away from it and, and so on and so forth and. And in, in some ways, I mean, I sort of stayed out of that, uh, possibly not really 
with any real sense of uh, direction yet. But in 2003, after this exhibition, I, I got a feeling that this is not really who I was or what I wanted to do. Um, I, while most other, well, not most other, but uh, several photographers were moving to what I would think of as the left field in photography, away from pictorialism into black and white, into sense of abstraction, abstraction so incredibly strong today. Um, I thought I wanted to embrace this sense of what I thought would be the super cliche. Uh, a sense of actually uh, how catching the beautiful at its, perhaps its magnificent beauty. Because the fact of the matter was that in all this uh, rejection of what uh, people were coming up with, for example, two days ago there was a discussion where one of the photographers actually said, but your shot is almost looking beautiful. And I think to myself that, well, perhaps uh, there's nothing wrong with such beauty. But anyway, I, I, it is, it's one of the aspects of life, and, and, I, and I got a lot of enrichment from dealing with it. And at the same time, uh, I moved in the, into the panoramic format. So for lack of a better word, I call myself the panoramist. And uh, the, the vision was interesting because uh, at the same time, you could deal with the detail and the scale. At the same time, you could decide where the frame started, where it ended, without having to change lenses all the time. At the same time, you uh, had the chance of looking all around you so as to sort of experience everything that was going on around you. So I, I thought it, initially it was just a, a little flame, and I kind of started off with this project, which was to showcase what I thought I did <coughs> was the, the monumental beauty of India. And and part of, part of uh, this panoramic format came from this thought that forever we were building things bigger and bigger. I mean. The, the moguls came and then they built these huge castles to, you know, uh, dwarf the earlier architecture. And then the colonials came and they built even bigger things. And so, so I said, I want something even bigger to dwarf what they did to show it for what it was, you know. And so it followed on to my uh, next book project, which came out uh, uh, last year. And um, and I thought to myself, actually, the, the Monumental India the book did incredibly well. It, uh, it was uh, acclaimed as the top 10 coffee table books of the world in 2008. And, and so it sort of was very encouraging. I mean, it was a, a format that uh, to uh, me was really interesting and so I was getting more and more engaged with it. Um, this, the size of why I made the book so, so big was also uh, sort of from the, uh, from the thought that the picture, sh in my opinion, that kind of picture should not be taken at one glance. And so if you had a book of the size and scale of that, you, you, were, you had physically turned your neck to be able to take in the, the entire scape. So it sort of, uh, you know, called for an involvement of the viewer with the subject. Um, and, and so I wanted to take this further. Now I thought 
it's all right to do something that's far and distant, but if you brought that same thing to, to people, to uh, you know, something which was so intimate, something so close around you, uh, which was also fluid and moving, um, then it sort of it was almost as you placed the viewer right in the middle of this of the activity itself, and and I thought that that would really bring a new dimension to what I was doing. So th this was in uh, the west, uh, sorry, the east coast, south of Pondicherry, and it's pre-tsunami, uh, but that Dwoparam just sort of went away because the sea is now recorded to be half a kilometer inside where it used to be about a century ago. And in fact, when I last went there, it's dis it dissolved completely and vanished. And, and this was more to me about the floating sets of hands in the middle, which sort of had a life of their own as if they were doing their own dance. And, and, and here again, I mean, I, w I wasn't playing that, you know, political role. I wasn't coming from this judgment thing. They were actually Swami Narayan uh, sect people who were in Khajura, hardly the sort of place they should be in. But anyway, they were there. So, but, you know, it, it, knowing that and recognizing that, but still, you know, going with the flow made sense to me. This is actually it's a, it's a, it's another battu which is guarding off the spirits on the top of this uh, bungalow on the beach. It's called in Trankoba. and uh, eclectic. Uh, Darka Pet, who's, who was having his own Quran lesson inside his home. And this, you know, his home is the most interesting place. And, and what I did for the Sacred India book was that um, I sort of tried to steer away from the uh, regular, I mean, I put in a few images, but it was mostly about uh, private spiritual practice. It was sort of devoid of trying to make a either religious or a statement of, you know, the festivities are, of what has become not spiritual about us anymore. So th this was at Anandpur Sahib, but except it was quite far away and it was sort of disconnected from the, all the festivities. And so these steps uh, on the right lead down to that kund on the left where you float and you pray on that shivling. So in a way it became possible uh, through this to sort of tell a story, which is what was very interesting, you know. There was uh, the, the physical act of making an image uh, meant that uh, you could uh, record it over perhaps a few seconds, or perhaps a few minutes, or perhaps a few hours. Um, and so it became to me that what I was doing was creating what I thought to be a experiential picture. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't a split second, there was nothing, you know, this, this man went down, took off his robe, and then went and floated. So this was the story to me. It was, it, you know, it sort of made a different kind of statement. That means you clicked in a period of time. Yeah. And the, the frame was on sweet pictures? Yeah, many pictures. Yeah. Yeah, 
the old, the old, the old, yeah, the old stitched panorama. Well, they all change. Yes. Well, it could be four or six. You will see later. You will see in the next. You will see that. You you start seeing the stitch lines as well. So so here there's yeah. So there was this entire procession across, which again may not be uh, the same split second, but it's the experience of someone and me standing in that corner in that space and being there for a while. Or at uh, Hazrat Bal in Kashmir, Srinagar. Now the thing is that uh, I mean, being a, you know born in in the 60s and being grown up in the world of 80s, we, we sort of did our bit just to say that we're not going to go and set up things and do things and and so even though I had gone to the main photographic workshops just straight out of college and and I had Bill Allard uh, you know talk to me and he said that look if there's an offending thing in front of you go and pick it up and put it on the side. But uh, in practice, uh, perhaps if it's a commercial shoot, I would do it. But here, I would sort of just quietly be the observer, more or less. I mean, yes, you take a standpoint, you take a viewpoint. But more than that, I'm trying to capture literally everything I can see there, in a certain sense. Now, here, um, again, so that we, that the girl on the, on the right, then goes, you know, remarkably with her mother in front of all this uh, sculpture and then she ties that little thread on the left and while her mother waits and then she goes away. And this, for me, a bit of an iconic picture of, you know, technology through the heart of religion going into a question mark, which I thought was so nice to have a question mark. <laughs> so anyway, now, um, the thing is that uh, uh, obviously the, the panorama technique has become, uh, become obsessed by it, and I'm frightened of that. But anyway, I, I'm enjoying it still. And, uh, so I've been working steadily on, you know, concurrently on several projects. And this one perhaps began five years ago and is uh, going to hopefully be published next year. And uh, so, I mean, there is a deadline set by the fact that, uh, you know, I don't want it to go on forever and ever. At least I want it to finish as a book and perhaps I can continue, and I, and I do that, continue taking more images uh, for it, perhaps for a uh, new edition or, or something else. And uh, so it's, uh, uh, it's an interesting mix of Indian homes across cultural, social backgrounds. Um, how I pick those homes is uh, a little bit random. I, uh, since I travel so much, I, I travel to as many homes I can. I keep asking, I keep looking. But it's to uh, sort of capture a sense of what today is. As some of it is, you know, so quintessentially Indian but disappearing fast. I thought uh, this picture would might give ideas to Subodh Gupta because the little black spots on the wall where the thalis had been is an addition from what he does. Actually, actually, yes. Yeah. It should be a little bit denser than this, but. 
to the quintessential Godrej cupboard, which I, I don't know, you know, we don't pay attention to. It's a hero and it's disappearing on the Gongar television. Is a, so that's not really going to go for a while. And, you know, versus a, a modern home where one of those artworks is more than the worth of the entire other house. <coughs> to uh, this man who's sitting on his motorcycle and this motorcycle is called the hunk and that's his uh, house in Odisha. So he's just acquired this. So are you doing things to Yeah, so, so here you can clearly see and I'm running it uh, like I find it. So uh, you can see that this is made up of six images. And, uh, and so that's what it is. I mean, some are bigger, some are lesser. So I can stop, I, you know, it's interesting. I can stop the picture where I like. Um, How many degrees? This, this is, you can see the same road in front of you. So you're obviously about one to 200 <coughs> degrees about, or thereabouts. Uh, it's a little tricky controlling the perspective, but I leave it loose, I, but I do it a little bit to make sure that it doesn't look too, uh, you know, overly distorted. So you at least get a feel of what you're looking at. But uh, but I thought that, you know, I thought this sort of, for me, represented vision more. Because, I mean, when you look at uh, the sum total of what you see with your eyes, there are no edges, and it sort of bleeds out into nothingness. And I thought that if I had loose edges instead of rectangles, which, which was, you know, a necessity of a film medium, then, you know, we have gone beyond that, so why should we have edges anymore? So, you know, it, it represented for me better the vision of a double eye and a neck to turn that onto. So, so a strong... Uh, house in one of those old houses of Pondicherry, the French Quarter. <coughs> in a Lucknow family where you can't see but they kind of um, don't look at me. Uh, interestingly, uh, in this study, uh, I tend to walk in and tell them, I mean I've obviously introduced myself to them and talked to them several times. And, but, but when I can come in, I tell them they can't dress up for my picture, you know, I'm not doing a fashion study on their best wear for their home and be what they are. And I also tell them, where would you like it photographed and what, you know, what do you taste, do you value in your house the more and most and where would you like to sit and what do you, where do you, I mean, I, then the fact that I tell them, acknowledge me, I am here and I don't see any reason why you should pretend that I'm not here and you're living your lives out. So I let them <coughs> sort of look into the camera and perhaps that's what I get and sometimes I don't. But uh, it's, it's, a <coughs> it's, it's sort of a, some partly a way of being in their lives without uh, making too much of a fuss of you know, really invading their lives. And it's partly sort of documentative in nature. Not that it can be, because the moment you're there, you have uh, changed their lives. <coughs> so this is a uh, one of the Calcutta families, the one of, really the offshoot of one of the Rabindranath Tagore families. So really fine sculpture on the sides. Gujarati home. And, 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 and sort of a little, a few social comments because here uh, these four women are actually the grandmother, <coughs> her daughter in law in the red chunni, and the red chunni's daughter in law is the yellow chunni, and her daughter is this girl in the, in the pink. And so this entire concept of who has to do Bhungat from whom. Because uh, the one in the yellow now has to do hunger from two of the older women. And that little girl is, is you know, has to do hunger from no one. So it's a little bit odd, you know, in that house where everyone's sort of hiding their faces from each other. And one of these uh, 
Art Deco palace is. I mean, it's been shot again and again, but I think, you know, just the, the very format helps me sort of to give a little more emphasis to what this space is all about and people's relationship to it. You know, the Noblin uh, at the back of where she is. And this uh, incredible uh, Jain uh, brothers, three brothers, who set up three identical houses in the middle of nowhere in Burj, near Burj. <coughs> this uh, Bollywood-style lawyer in, in outside Delhi. <coughs> this, uh, this musician and his two daughters, Melody and Harmony. <laughs> Actually, in the, pan the panoramic format suffers from projection the most, so I'm, I'm sorry, it's not going to be as good as ever on paper. Because that this thing is a lot about the detail in the picture. So here, again, an interesting comment of this man with his two daughters, who are two years apart, and the one on the right has been just got married, and she's just come back home, so she's all in the Close and this one on the left is uh, much of a tomboy. In Kashmir. And again in Kashmir, it's so interesting, you know, with the cow and the drawing room and the kitchen and the stairs going up, and it's like a real labyrinth in there. And this woman, uh, since I told her what would she like to do, she she just started to lie down. <laughs> and uh, through a study of, you know, uh, interestingly, uh, because of this, the nature of how it's done. Uh, uh, you know, taking bits and pieces, I can sort of create a reality of of uh, of my liking in some ways. But uh, I mean, they're honest to the place. But it's just uh, it's just that these group of people were not there at the same time. really close, like the front subject is probably just four feet from me or something. Yeah. What's the normal lensing that you use for these panoramas? Yeah, that would be wide only, mostly. And you choose to shoot from the same spot? Well, you have to. But is it like a 35 mm? No, 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 the thing is that uh, actually it, it may become a, we don't want to make it a technical discussion, but the thing is uh, after a little while the technique becomes irrelevant, you know, because uh, like the Sacred India book, 80% of it was shot off camera just with me holding the camera in my hand and rotating around the camera. If you just pretend that there is actually a, a metal thing running through the front of your camera, then you can do it without, you know, having a tripod. So you just learn on the job. I mean, not for this study because this was done over like 15 minutes with the subjects. Uh, but interestingly, the the gungad of the Rajasthani woman was stronger than the gungad of the Muslim woman. So that came. So.
So interesting that there's this fellow taking Guru Dakshana, so he's touching his feet, another fellow is hugging him, and there's this fellow in the middle with a deodorant spraying his underarms, and that fellow on the right ironing and getting ready. So here now there are only bits and pieces of people left, so they're sort of going away into oblivion. And so, in terms of where it's all moving forward to for me, um, because I mean something interesting is, is coming out of all this, is, uh, is the fact that uh, much like the uh, art of uh, miniature paintings, where uh, you know in a single miniature, an entire depiction of a scene of, let's say, the procession arriving and the kings being seated on the throne, happens in a single miniature, um, uh, I'm sort of discovering that it's closer to, in some ways, to the video. So uh, here, this man looks up and walks away. And so it's, uh, it's a sort of a story of him looking up and going away. Yeah, this is? That's up in Kashmir. And in, this is a story of this man, yeah, this rolling the, turning the wheels. Why have you not kept the testimony? This, this was actually part of the Sacred India book. So unfortunately at that time I fought a lot. I wanted the edges, but this entire thing of a coffee table book, unfortunately, which is also interesting because uh, the other day uh, when we were sitting with Dominic Lapierre, he said your prize is all wrong. You shouldn't have got the coffee table award because your book is a banquet table book. <laughs> and this is a picture of this man's journey across the street. So I mean, the, the picture yours it do a bit, you know, and there's a smile that develops on the buildings. But if you enjoy the smiles, it's not such a bad thing. I mean, all the architects tear their hair out sometimes, but. But that can be all corrected also. I mean, there, there are enough things to make it all straight, but I don't want to tamper with this study anyway. And, uh, and two kids having a good time. So, when they run around and run away, and the dog follows them around. And the boat across the man on his rounds. It's quite a round. And so that pretty much brings me to, actually there's, there's more, but it's uh, it's not ready, and so I will show it if I get a chance next time. So there, there's more stories evolving, and because I, each of these stories is um, probably three to five years, and but the thing is, if you just do one story, then you know, you only do that many stories, so we work on more than one at a time. The fortunate thing has been is that I've been able to replace my commercial work with with work of this nature because uh, I sort of made it a point that it has to work, otherwise what's the point? You want to just say do personal work and not earn money and then have to go and prostitute yourself. So I said, that, you know, we have to, f have to find a model that works for me where at least so, you know, it's financially good and it's uh, satisfying, uh, and which it tends to be. Um, the, the books uh, are 
completely self-managed in, uh, in the sense that they are uh, all the work is done between me and I in the partner of mine. So from start to end to the entire print and finish and you know proofs, proofs and press checks and everything that we all do that. So yeah, that I feel sorry about because it takes me away for two or three months uh, into another realm and it's always not such a good thing to get back into life after that. But uh, it's uh, it's very rewarding when the book comes out ultimately. So questions? Thank you. thing too, you know, because then when you have too much of it, then sometimes everything is too much. It's like, uh, you know, uh, we've been uh, looking at portfolios here, and uh, so if everyone's style becomes, becomes the same, then it's, you know, where is it all getting to? So I think you know, some bits of it is nice. It is good for certain things, but I mean, technically a lot of traditionalists will argue, this is not photography, what are you doing? Even I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah, that also, I mean, it's not instantaneous reality, you know, there are all sorts of levels to it. So, uh, even I don't know what it is, that's why I call myself the panoramist. Because it's a very decisive moment. <laughs> too many decisive moments. Too many, too many centers of attention. Where, I mean, we've not heard all this, so it's all new in some way. Yeah, no, but, um, that, then that, I, I suppose arrives by itself, you know, with anything you will engage with, you will always discover something new can come out of it. So I don't know what's next, but I think at this point it's quite interesting, you know, it's taking me somewhere. And, and the other thing is I'm not, I'm not seeing it somewhere elsewhere. I, I'd love to, you know, see it around the world where I, I see Googling. I don't find anything I've seen. I want to see it. How do you find such incredible places like that place? This house. Well, in some ways you have to shoot incredibly fast. I mean, like, you know, yeah, so you do like that and fire. <laughs> like, so, you put it on, literally on uh, one of those high and what, and really get it. Because, I mean, it is like creating that instant. In some of you have to do that. There's no other way of doing it. In some ways, to be very, you have to be knowledgeable about how you do panoramas. So, you have to plan yourself where you're going to be. And you have to obviously have a very flexible neck. <laughs> Around to you now. Any questions? No, but, but, but uh, you know, the thing is, uh, it's for me to ask you, you know, how, how do you, I mean, I know it's the, the, uh, the image unfortunately does not translate itself into the quality of what we are working towards, but I mean, uh, it would be interesting to have comments if nobody's got questions. Little frame with the final. That's my frame. So I'm giving you everything. 
I think that really makes a big difference, seeing that as opposed to a traditional yeah. rectangle, because yeah. the traditional rectangle makes you believe yeah. some yeah. reality that was having yeah. thoughts and then which adds a level of something to think about, that it's an image that was made. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. Now, nowadays, he, those frames you can go as a, you know you can get them in shop and yeah, everyone on on your camera also you can put yeah. frames and make it, like okay, make it look like a castle palace. And I'm sure nobody's gonna invent this frame. <laughs> <laughs> if you lens vignettes, do you let that also stay? Um, my lenses don't vignette. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, the vignette will get uh, cut off by the overlap. So. Sometimes, sometimes so really you have to be sure about the amount of overlap you do. So and the colors are matching really? Or the, the software takes care. So in any case, you have to do everything manually. So it's all manual, color manual exposure. It's not or anything, it's nothing done automatically. Yeah. Actually, I, I can uh, do any which way. So if I'm tripoded, I can do a dance. I can do left image, right image, center image, wherever I work, and then join it all together. So it's not a, there, there has to be no sequence for me. I have to remember to shoot all of them. I can't suddenly have a gap in the middle. shoot multiple in one? Yeah, yeah. So it's interesting, you know, it is, it is image building. You know, that's clearly there. There is an image being there. So it's, it's, it's an experience. It's like, it's, it's actually, every time I look at it, it brings me back to that spot. Or standing there and, you know, spending time there. Not just hanging out, not getting that time out. None of that, you know. Yeah, uh, I saw that Secret India book of yours. It was absolutely stunning. Just, just opening the spread to look at it was uh, brilliant. Uh, could you tell us a little bit more about how you went about publishing it with this? Uh, actually, they're pretty much uh, done in-house. We are and my partner have a company called Panorama Books. I mean, obviously. <laughs> 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 so anyway, uh, so we make the book ourselves and then she takes it to Frankfurt and tries to pre-sell it. Um, so in fact, Sacred India has just been launched in, in London now. and. Uh, but unfortunately, the world market is such, it's an expensive book, and so it's not going into a language edition yet. But uh, but we kind of handle the entire thing, so I handle all the color, all issues, whether we color together, I handle image selection, I handle sequencing, she has her role. So, I mean, between the two of us, we decide who's going to do what, and we, so I do, I, I do the pre-press, I do the press checks. Uh, she handles all the shipping, the billing, the costing, the, you know, all the dirty work. As far as the Panova is concerned. So, so between, uh, yeah, between, between the two of us, I think we managed pretty well on all this. I mean, we have our fights, and, but, it's in, but it's an incredibly enriching process to do the whole thing and to do this large-scale book because it's not easy to do. I mean, the, the budget for Monumental India and Sacred <coughs> India is 50 lakhs each. And so, you know, to deal with 50 lakhs of rupees is not a, you know, it's not a child's play. But anything goes wrong, maybe anything goes wrong in the book and the shipment, and shipment doesn't reach, you're in trouble. So, Where do you get it printed? It's uh, in China. Actually, the first edition of Sacred was printed in Bombay, but I wasn't happy, so I've gone back to China. But where Monumental was printed. And India at home will also go to China. Because, uh, I think at the end of the day, uh, I become a little wary of the the Bengali Babu saying why it can't be done. Interesting that India has to go to China.
In fact, uh, I think increasingly, uh, well, that's actually one side of it. The other side, which I'm, I'm not showing now, is uh, going into the people more. So I think, uh, I think uh, my uh, uh, my seriousness of the documentary aspects are now on the other level are taking over. So it's now just for me a medium to capture what I want to capture. And that's, in fact, an incredibly exciting project. In two years hence, hopefully you will see it. But it's um, it's it's incredible. It's cross-generational. It's it's really a, yeah, it's, yeah, it's today's in here. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, anything, yeah, it's, uh, that's the thing, uh, yeah, we, it, invariably it becomes a technical thing, you know. So that's a little bit of a pity when it does. You were working in film or in film? Sorry? They were all in digital or in film? The panoramas are all digital. Yeah. Actually, I did, initially I did a, a, I did these all operation rooms for the, for the army. So I went to all the 20,000 high peaks and I shot China with specialized equipment where you could see 20 kilometers in and you could read number plates. And I did these huge panoramas of camps in, in China. So that really set me on to the panorama. So those were prints which we pasted onto boards and we created these 20 foot long panels for them.